Hello, History St. Louis. Today we take a look at our second immigrant group uh, during this fourth unit. Uh, today we take a look at the Germans and learn a little bit about their impact on St. Louis history and culture and society. Uh, so let's get with it. You'll, you'll want to have your, uh, your worksheet with you from the German immigration articles that you read uh, so that you can uh, still uh, so that you can follow along and make sure that you've got the right uh, answers. So early on, you learned a little bit about uh, the city of Bremen, which today is called Hyde Park uh, up here, uh, which is a community on the north side. And it is one of the areas that we colored in blue or colored in German, I should say, when we talked about uh, the German immigration. Uh, the city of Bremen was started by Emil Mallinckrodt, uh, Emil Mallinckrodt then went on to have two sons, and the Mallinckrodt started Mallinckrodt Chemical, which becomes, uh, initially it was developed for fertilizers for farmers, um, and then eventually they get into, by the World War II, they are helping to make plutonium or get plutonium in order to use it for uh, making the atomic bomb. And so the Mallinckrodt Chemical has connections both to farming and to World War II. Uh, in development of the bomb. Uh, but they had basically developed this neighborhood uh, as a German enclave. Uh, as you well know, lots of North St. Louis was uh, for uh, the Germans uh, at the time that they started coming here. One of the things that they will also do, not they, the Mallinckrodt's, but the Germans, is uh, they are going to bring to St. Louis uh, their religion, namely Lutheranism. Uh, and in order to start training people uh, for the seminary uh, in those Protestant religions, the Germans are going to start Concordia Seminary, uh, which, as you can see, is literally right next door to uh, the western side of uh, Forest Park. And so Concordia Seminary is started by the Germans. Uh, as you know from your sheet, it is uh, one of the first schools to allow both men and women to go there simultaneously. So it's a co-ed college. Um, it is still around today. It is still doing co-ed education for the seminary. Uh, you learn later on down uh, a very controversial statue for the St. Louis area. Um, it was entitled The Naked Truth. Uh, it was supposed to be an honoring uh, the German uh, contributions to uh, journalism and spreading the truth. And so that is the, the thought behind the statue. The statue is of a naked woman. She is bearing all, so to speak. And she's holding two flames, uh, signifying that she's shining the light on uh, the truth, if it will. Initially, when we started, we weren't sure if these were German words or what. Um, I had a student do some research, and these were three famous uh, German journalists um, who they decided to honor when they created the Naked Truth statue. Um, the Naked Truth statue is located at the Compton Hill Water Tower uh, right at 44 and Grand. <clears throat> so this is on the south side of St. Louis. Uh, you can sort of see the reservoir right here in the background. The water tower would be off to the left. Um, but this statue is still around today. Here it is. Uh, it is still around today and uh, looks just like it did back in the day. <clears throat> you learned a little bit about some German architecture that makes its way to St. Louis. This is known as Falkwerk architecture. Um, its um, main features are a stone or brick base. And then the other element that really gives it away is the exposed timbers that you see uh, that help make up the, the building itself. Those exposed timbers are what really give this away. In St. Louis, um, one of the most famous areas, which has now been shut down, um, was a restaurant and outdoor, ball, outdoor bar called Schneidhorse. Um, it was right at Limburg and Clayton. Clayton would dead end into Limburg. Uh, it was famous for the outdoor beer garden. Uh, 
um, that you can see right here in the picture, but you can very easily see the Falkwork architecture with the exposed wood beams um, in, uh, <clears throat> in the design of the building. Those aren't structural, those are really just decorative, and those aren't actually timbers that's just painted on or uh, it's just a facade. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this is now closed, so we don't have this, but we do still have Bevo Mill, which is on the south side of St. Louis. This was a restaurant started by the Bush family during Prohibition, and it was halfway between their home uh, at Grant's Farm and the brewery, and so they had a place where they could stop off and, and eat and drink uh, on the way to and from uh, their locations. Uh, you can see here uh, that it also has some, ex you can see the stone uh, building and then further on down the way, you have the exposed timber look as well. One of the major elements of German social society was the Turnverein. Turnvereins were basically a combination of a workout place like a Gold's Gym and a bar so that you would have a place to work out and, and lift weights and, or do calisthenics or gymnastics as was the, was the fad back in the day. And then you would come back uh, after freshening up and have beverages there that would basically turn into a men's club or a uh, social club. Um, here is one of the Turnverines uh, in North St. Louis. The building still stands, um, but it is now abandoned but you can see German writing on the building, uh, which harkens back to its previous days as a Turnverein. Uh, and Turnvereins were very, very popular in St. Louis um, as sort of German enclaves where you could meet fellow Germans, uh, work out, and then have beverages with them afterwards. Uh, we also learned about Susan Blow and her contribution to the field of education. Uh, the Blow family is very well known in St. Louis. We've already studied them. Susan's father was the uh, one of the early owners of Dred Scott. Uh, later on, her brother would repurchase Dred Scott and then free him. Um, and so the Blow family, very well known. Susan Blow was known for uh, the field of education and bringing kindergarten to uh, the United States. There were some private kindergartens in the United States, but she will open up the first public kindergarten um, in Carondelet at this school, which is the De Pere School. The building is still there today. It's basically a museum that is set up, uh, and this is the classroom that she was in. <clears throat> and they have that classroom set up as, the, as it was back when Susan Blow taught there. Uh, St. Louis was the first to make kindergarten part of the public school system. Um, obviously, now it is a mainstay in education, uh, but we were the first to pioneer that uh, in the public school setting here in St. Louis with Susan Blow. Um, so for the culinary aspects of um, German society, there are a couple main things that the Germans are known for, mainly their desserts. Uh, and so a couple of famous ones. On the left-hand side here, you have the world-famous Black Forest Cake. A Black Forest Cake is a chocolate cake layered with cream. And then on the top, it is garnished with a heavy dose of cherries. And those are Morello cherries, which also tend to come from uh, the German area. Um, very decadent, uh, very sweet, uh, highly suggested. The other one is called a German chocolate cake, but it really is a misnomer. It has nothing to do with the country. It has to do with uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. German, who comes up with this different kind of chocolate, a lighter chocolate, more brown, uh, a light brown than a dark brown, uh, and he comes up with this new kind of chocolate, um, and then it is garnished on top with this topping that includes the ever-famous coconut. Um, and so German chocolate cakes have nothing to do with the country, uh, but 
they are associated with German cuisine. Uh, we also know that German cuisine includes uh, pickling. Uh, pickles are nothing more than cucumbers that are soaked in a salty brine. Um, and the Germans uh, were well known for pickles. And then they didn't stop with the cucumber. They then started pickling other things and most famously cabbage, which gives us sauerkraut. And if you remember back from unit two and we took a look at cholera, because German immigrants were coming down with cholera, they, one of the thoughts was that sauerkraut was the cause of cholera, which is completely bogus. Um, sauerkraut today is used primarily to garnish hot dogs and bratwursts and all sort of sausages and whatnot. Um, I cannot say that I am a big fan of sauerkraut. Uh, I am a very big fan of the kosher dill pickle, though. And then finally, the St. Louis connection to all of this. A baker, a German baker, was trying to make a butter cake. Uh, think of basically a Sara Lee pound cake. Um, but messed up the ingredients and put way too much sugar in his butter cake so that the edges of the cake cooked crisp, but the middle was left undone or gooey. Uh, so then he just decided to try to get rid of the cake by sprinkling some powdered sugar on the top and then putting it out for a real cheap price. He does it, it is bought, and then the next day people come back screaming for more because they thought it was delicious and thus St. Louis invents um, one of the best desserts of all time, the gooey butter cake. Uh, I highly suggest that you try some. Uh, in fact, I would give extra credit uh, in order for you to try some and, and post it. Maybe your teacher will let you do a Flipgrid video of a food review of the uh, of the gooey butter cake because it is one of the best things that has ever been created in St. Louis history. So there you go. Now uh, we'll stop here and we'll get to the Irish tomorrow. So for those of you watching this, go ahead and stop it now. And we will uh, come back and take a look at this with the Irish in St. Louis uh, in a day or two. Bye-bye.